So we're seeing Yuji hit Sukuna with a massive black flash, and it's pretty significant because apparently it is awakening Yuji. Yeah, finally our MC is getting quote unquote awakened here. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, you know, we'll get into it. We'll, we'll go over all that stuff because it's happening at the end of the chapter more so. But this chapter is mostly about the actual Black Flash in general. Because, you know, coming off of the previous chapter, we saw Sakuna hit LaRue with a Black Flash. That was actually the second in this fight. The first he hit Maki a couple chapters back. And after he hit LaRue with that Black Flash at the end of the previous chapter, the narrator implied that Sukuna was gonna get some kind of buff from this, something like that, because when we saw Gojo taking on Sukuna and he hit him with his second Black Flash, he regained his ability to regulate his reverse curse technique. Because like, if you hit Black Flashes, you have like the chance of I guess getting a, a, some kind of like a buff from it, you, you could say, like some kind of bonus, kind of like in a video game. And I'll compare more things to video game logic once we get more into the Black Flash discussion that Gojo is gonna talk about in the beginning of this chapter, because it says that when you hit like a Black Flash, you can like feel omnipotent. And if everything revolves around you, it can lead to greatly increased performance in combat, allowing the user to operate at like 120% of their maximum potential. So we're just giving out buffs here if you can hit Black Flashes. On top of the buff that Black Flash already is. Now, what was the Black Flash buff that Sukuna got from hitting LaRue in the previous chapter? Well, I mean, it's not, as far as I know, outright stated in this chapter, but he does improve his dismantle output. So I guess his cursed energy output in general had increased or regulated better, I suppose. But first guys, I know we all love watching anime, but sometimes it can be a bit difficult with the streaming platforms and their exclusivity, and of course the region blocking. Well, you don't have to worry anymore because you can get around all of that stuff with Safe Shell VPN. Safe Shell VPN offers amazing speed and incredibly fast connections without bandwidth with or traffic limitations. But best of all, Safeshell VPN also has an exclusive feature called App Mode, which allows you to connect different apps to specific VPN servers. This means simultaneous access to global content without the need to switch servers. Like for example, you can connect to the Japanese servers for watching Netflix while keeping your connection to where you're living so you can watch things like, let's say ESPN. I mean, just take a look at how much content opens up on Netflix and Disney Plus with this thing. And of course, you also get security with Safe Shell VPN as well, because within the app lies a security page, which is like a transparent view into how your IP is hidden and your data protected. Safe Shell VPN also extends across various platforms like Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android, Apple TV, Android TV, and even Apple Vision Pro. You just need one account for full cross-platform access. So guys, if you wanna get the most secure streaming experience with incredibly high speed like me, check out Safe Shell VPN. You can download it by clicking the link in the description. Thanks guys. But anyway, going into Gojo's speech about Black Flash in the beginning of this chapter, again, this is a flashback. Gojo's not alive or, you know, I'm not saying that he won't be, but I just don't want to hype up anybody. This is a flashback of him talking about the Black Flash and he explains what it is. So it's like a distortion in space that occurs when cursed energy is applied to a strike or something like that within like 0 0.000001 seconds of a physical hit. And when you achieve it, you know, the cursed energy flashes black and red like Conqueror's Hockey from One Piece. And then the power derived from it is equal to a normal hit to the power of 2.5. So that doesn't mean like times 2.5 to the power. So if Sukuna's power at base is like 10, you know, from a normal strike to the power of 2.5, it would become 316. So that's how significant the Black Flash is here. And then going further into Gojo's monologue here, he says that, you know, if that's all you really need to do, then he in theory would be able to intentionally do it. You know, if all you need to do is just time the cursed energy output with a physical strike to 0. 0.00001 of a second, then yeah, somebody as skilled as Gojo 
would be able to do that at will, which I assumed as well, because yes, that seems like an incredibly daunting task to us in our reality, but you know, in the Jujutsu Kaisen world, things are obviously different. But going further, Gojo just kind of says that it's not that simple, and explaining it that way doesn't necessarily literally explain what the Black Flash is. And I won't bore you with more of Gojo's monologue here. You can just read it for yourself if you really want to get into it. But what I'm taking away from this is that the Black Flash, like the video games that we were talking about, which Gege himself has compared Jujitsu itself to video games, actually in the very beginning of the series, like when Gojo is explaining how domains and barriers work to Yuji when he's going against Jogo. Hey, but real quick guys, please subscribe if you haven't already. I know a lot of you watch my videos through the recommended and that's fine, but if you just need a reminder to subscribe, here you go. Let's get to 300,000. I've really been slacking off on asking you guys to do that. I just want to get to 300,000 then I'll just, I'll stop bringing it up. I, I just want to get to that point. I, I feel like it's, it's overdue at this point. Thanks. Hitting a black flash is RNG, essentially. If you're familiar with that term from video games, random number generating. So while it is like a literal critical hit in the lore of Jujutsu Kaisen, it is also literally a critical in the world of it as well. Like you can try your hardest and be the best like Sukuna and Gojo and time your punch and cursed energy output to 0 0.000001 of a second, but that doesn't mean that it's guaranteed that the Black Flash is going to happen. You can do it like a hundred times and then maybe the Black Flash will happen like three or four out of that if that makes sense. It's like literally landing a critical hit in a video game. I mean, as long as you don't add any kind of buffs or gear or spells or whatever that augment the chance of you hitting criticals, if it's just the base RNG of the video game, it's essentially like landing a critical, even in the world of Jujutsu Kaisen. That's why I guess it's plainly just explained as a pure phenomenon. And Gojo goes further saying that like, Nanami has the record of landing the most consecutive black flashes, but that doesn't mean that he's like more skilled than Gojo. Also, if you want to see Nanami landing the record for consecutive Black Flashes, you can check it out in like the third act of the Volume Zero movie. But he's able to do that because his fights last longer than Gojo's. Like if Gojo even gets to the point of landing a Black Flash in a fight, it's probably already over unless he's going against Kuna, of course. So yeah, that's my rant about Black Flash and trying to make sense of what Gojo is saying here. But going further, everyone is like taking on Sukuna at this point, like we saw in the previous chapter. Choso, Yuji, and Maki are all back and they're all trying their individual ways to try to stifle him. Like Yuji is using like this barrier to try to encase him and Choso's trying to hit him with a piercing blood. It's not working and he breaks away from that and Maki's able to stab Sukuna again in like the abdomen with her soul splitting blade. He kind of just takes it on the chin. I mean, not literally, but he just eats it. Like it's not really affecting him all that much unless this is gonna be a delayed effect eventually. But after this, Sakuna hits a black flash on Maki. This is the second black flash he's hit on her. And then the follow-up to that is hitting her with a dismantle, which is like straight up cutting her. And it's at this point that we find out that Sakuna's dismantle output has increased from what it has before, which I assume is from the buff that consecutive black flashes give you. So Sakuna is recovering ground here. Although he hasn't regenerated his left hands yet, he's still making progress at least with the cursed energy output. Then going further into the fight, he takes on Choso, and after a brief scuffle, he hits Choso with another black flash. But Choso is able to mitigate the damage by using like blood manipulation convergence to like make a shield, I suppose, which like encapsulates Sukuna's hand. And I guess he's just not taking the full brunt of the black flash because Choso's still conscious after this. So Choso's surviving this for now. And yeah, two black Black flashes back to back almost which is insane but still it goes back to what was talked about in the beginning of this chapter where you can't just do it you know willingly it kind of just happens randomly even if you are doing the technique quote unquote perfectly so after choso is able to mitigate the damage by using the blood to wrap around sakuna's arm yuji comes back in and lands a serious shot on sakuna's face and this is significant of course because of how yuji's strikes work on sakuna 
which Choso points out. Because Yuji has the ability to like strike Sukuna's soul. And by doing that, he can dwindle his cursed energy output as well as the control that he has over Megumi's body. And eventually, in theory, separate Megumi's body from Sukuna and vice versa. And he even says like, regardless of how many buffs Sukuna is getting from Black Flash, it doesn't matter as long as Yuji keeps landing these significant strikes on him. Then Yuji tries to use blood manipulation convergence, but he's still not perfect at it, as Choso says. But Yuji is still able to fire off a piercing blood, which Sukuna like narrowly dodges. And going back to what we've been talking about these last couple months, like how is Yuji able to use blood manipulation here? Well, it wasn't explained. I, I suppose they had some kind of training during that one month time skip, but I guess it also goes into why Yuji has like those gauntlets, which you speculated about possibly Yuji eating the other curse womb death paintings. Like Choso and his brothers are derived from those curse womb paintings that Kenjaku made back in the day when he was in the original Noritoshi Kamo's body. And three of them became Choso and his brothers, but the rest of them kind of just stayed as the cursed wombs. And it's implied that Yuji just ate them and then got some kind of power up from them, which I guess includes him gaining the ability to use blood manipulation or at least the propensity to be able to just use it without inherently having the technique, if that makes sense. Yuji is also able to use this blood manipulation that he's been taught through Choso uh, to further enhance his own reverse curse technique because it's not perfect. You know, he learned it in a month. So going further into the battle between Yuji and Sukuna, Sukuna senses that Yuji's about to land a black flash on him, similar to how Mahito knew that it was going to happen back in the Shibuya arc. And before he can like fully concentrate and try to counter against it, Sukuna's attention is brought away and he's suddenly focusing on LaRue, the guy that he hit with a black flash in the previous chapter. And this is because LaRue's curse technique is more nuanced than we thought. So LaRue says that if he's grabbed someone with his curse technique, which is like that ability to generate those big cursed energy hands or whatever, seemingly just the right hand at this point, which he had grabbed Sukuna in the previous chapter with, then he can grab onto their quote unquote heart. Now, I don't think that literally means like grabbing like the physical tangible heart, but I guess it just means that you can grab onto just their consciousness or something. I don't know. It's just a plot device here for Sukuna to be distracted so that Yuji can hit him uh, with the follow-up strike that he's going to, I guess. Because we see like Sukuna's eyes become hearts, which is like LaRue's thing. He has like hearts on his chest. So yeah, LaRue, this is like his ultimate moment, I suppose. Distracting Sukuna using the secondary effect of his curse technique so that Yuji can land a freaking black flash on Sukuna. Yes, it's been a while since Yuji has landed the Black Flash, but he's hitting Sukuna with it, and it is massive. Like, it's bigger than the Black Flashes that we've seen Sukuna been landing. Like, lightning everywhere, hitting Sukuna directly in the chest. Because, you know, Sukuna knew that this was coming already, but like we said, LaRue was able to distract him long enough. And then the narrator at the end says the release of his potential through Black Flash awakens Yuji. So it goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning. What exactly does this mean? Well, I suppose it goes into the quote unquote buff that you get from landing Black Flash, where it leads to a greatly increased performance in combat, allowing the user to operate at 120% of their maximum potential. So I guess landing the Black Flash allows Yuji to fully bring out his potential, like it says, like the abilities that he's been having with landing the strikes on Sukuna that touch his soul, reverberate within him, and stifle his cursed energy output. I guess it's gonna bring out the full potential of that. And aside from that, it's also mentioned uh, after Gojo's monologue about the Black Flash in the beginning, when he says that, you know, comparing himself to Nanami's Black Flash record, he says, I win when it comes to total uses, meaning that out of all the Black Flashes that anyone has ever landed, I suppose, in the modern era, Gojo has landed the most. But it says after that from the narrator that after this, Yuji would overtake him, meaning that Yuji will eventually 
land more black flashes than Gojo ever has. Or at least that's what I'm taking away from this. So this is just the beginning of Yuji landing the most black flashes anyone has ever landed in the modern era of Jiu-Jitsu. I'm just assuming that's what this means here because if Gojo has the most, I guess it means the modern era because he's obviously not taking into account the Heian era where they were probably just landing black flashes like it was handshakes or something. So this makes sense because Yuji needs something like this in order to take down Sukuna. I mean, yeah, he has the soul reverberating punches and he can reduce his cursed energy output, but landing more black flashes, the most that has ever been landed, there might be some kind of anomaly that comes from this, like something that no one has discovered yet, because like we talked about, it is a phenomenon in itself. So if you just keep landing them and landing them, I guess the buffs that you get from it will keep compounding and stacking on each other, where you'll bring out even more than 120% of your maximum potential, you'll just I don't know, suddenly ascend to a level that you shouldn't be on, possibly. And that might happen with Yuji here. Now, again, let me also reiterate that Yuji still has that ability where he can seemingly swap bodies with people, like swap souls or something. Like he can take your soul, put it in his body, and then put his soul in your body. At least that's the implications that we got from that one sequence where he was training with Kusakabe during the one month skip. And since he hasn't used it yet, we can fully assume that he is saving it for the right moment against Sukuna. And maybe all of this black flashery will lead to him hitting Sukuna with that, which will, I guess, ultimately save Megumi, at least in that moment, and have a way to stop Sukuna. Now, I don't know if that's going to lead to Yuji's death, you know, we also talked about that theory, which I'll go over more maybe in another video because Megumi still needs to be dealt with as well as the big curse merger and Tengen. And I just think it would be super anticlimactic if all of that is resolved in a single sequence where Sukuna is just taken down and stops everything in the process. But let me know what you think about all of this stuff in the comments, guys. And if you liked the video, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.